Hi, I'm Catherine Jean Lopez from the National Review Institute, and I'm delighted to in, uh, welcome my friend, Father Patrick Briscoe, who is a Dominican priest and editor of our Sunday Visitors magazine. And he's also actually, so he's a Dominican priest, which means he, <laughs> he is a member of the order founded by St. Dominic. And he actually is co-author of a book on St. Dominic um, uh, and St. Dominic's way of life. And it's a book about how St. Dominic is relevant to our times. So I, I wanted to, to put that plug in since uh, since Christmas is coming. <laughs> and, and it is a, a, a great accessible book for, for somebody um, looking to give a, a, a nice spiritual book to uh, to, to a loved one. Um, Father Patrick, thanks for joining me and our people listening um, on YouTube uh, or watching. And uh, so speaking of Christmas, the reason why we wanted to sit down and talk is because you are going to Bethlehem for Christmas. And this is your first visit to the Holy Land. This is an odd time for someone. I mean, Christmas isn't an odd time, but if some might say it's an odd time. Your mother might say it's an odd time for you to choose to go to the Holy Land, given given um, what's going on there. But it's actually an even more important reason for you as a Catholic priest to go there, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again, Catherine, you know, for inviting me to be here with you. Uh, and I'm so excited to tell this story uh, not because I'm particularly thrilled to uh, to be going under these circumstances, but but it is so important that we shine a light on what Christians are experiencing in the Holy Land. And I think generally we all have a sense that when we approach Christmas and Easter, the the eyes of the world turn to those sacred places. And so it's a time when naturally the the thoughts of our co-religionists who live there come to mind. And for for that reason, this time of year, the trip is very important to me. Now, I would also say, typically during a normal Advent season, the Christians in Bethlehem who subsist basically entirely off of tourism, typically uh, they welcome 100,000 people during the Advent season. But this year, just a very small fraction. I mean, if it's even 1,000 people this season, I think they would be overcome with joy. They would be shocked. Uh, so their their livelihood has been severely impacted by the way the war has affected tourism, uh, the flow of pilgrims has dropped to just a meager trickle. Those big crowds are not coming. They know they're not coming. And so this trip is really principally to keep those brothers and sisters in Christ of ours uh, at the forefront of our mind, people who are who are affected deeply, not not always directly, but deeply impacted by by the conflict which is going on in the Holy Land. And for anyone who's never been, um, it, it really is, you see it so clearly um, when when you're in Bethlehem, you know, a bus of tourists unloads on one of these stores and that, you know, it, whether or not those buses come makes or breaks the day for, for these Christians in Bethlehem. And yeah, their goods are overpriced, but it's for a good cause that they're overpriced, you know? Um, I always spend way too much money when I'm there, but because I know they need it. I know they need it. Um, and, and there is such poverty there and that, and you're not going to make any kind of political point, um, about geopolitical politics. Um, you're going simply to educate people about the fact there are Christians there and they're suffering. No, that's exactly right. And the, the situation is, as you've just alluded to, it is so incredibly complex, uh, but I really believe that the most forgotten party in this whole conflict are the Christians who live there uh, because the, the Christians are torn as it were they're 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 torn in the conflict um having a having a foot in both worlds and so because of that positioning I, I really believe uh, not simply because they're Christians but because of the posture of Christianity in the region that they're they're the ones suffering the most now there are some incredible projects in Bethlehem for example in the in the December issue of our magazine we we prepared a beautiful profile about the Bethlehem Children's Hospital, known known fondly as the Be the Bethlehem Baby Hospital, where every year forty five hundred children are born in the in that little town where Jesus Christ was born. I mean, it's it's an amazing thing. That hospital is located. It's it's something like less than two thousand steps from the church and the nativity. So you have so you have the birthplace of Jesus Christ, and then you have this hospital, which is an incredible Christian ministry serving not just Christians but anyone in the region that yeah. needs care. 
Um, you've probably, Catherine, have you visited uh, that that hospital? You know, I haven't is? actually been to the hospital. No, I've I've interviewed people from the hospital, but I've never been. Yeah, so it's a well known, right, and 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 uh, well established apostolate, and the the people who work there uh, work there because. Uh, because of their love for for everyone in the region, but it but but the important thing here and the and the point that I really want to make about this particular ministry is that it's not a service for Christians; it's a service by Christians for anyone in need. And again, this just kind of highlights how Christians are are sort of torn in this conflict, um, serving who whoever comes to us, who, whoever whoever has a need, um, and it means that we don't that we don't really have a home in this conflict the way that. Uh, the 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 way that other other parties do, and that leads to because because we don't have that kind of home, that leads to a lack of easy alliance and a real risk, a real precarity um, that that's lived under. So uh, so again, I I really think that uh, that our brothers and sisters in Christ, that the Christians are some of the most forgotten here. Um, now, yeah, again, we we alluded to this. You alluded to this at the at the top of uh, at the top of our conversation. This is my first trip to the Holy Land. Um, you, you've, tr you've traveled there several times, I think, right? Um, mm -hmm, and, right. uh, and I'm, I'm so excited to go, uh, just this, this first time. And for me, uh, a huge part of the reason why I want to go at this time of year, and this really gets to your question, um, is to make a spiritual journey, to make a real pilgrimage, um, to go as a priest to these sacred sites on these feast days, and to observe them in the places where they're observed by our brothers and sisters um, and draw attention to how they're observed there. So on the trip, I'll be able to be in Bethlehem for Christmas. We've got several days around Bethlehem. I'll be staying with uh, Christian families there, going to Mass at the Church in the Nativity. That Mass is usually presided over by the Patriarch of Jerusalem, so I hope to be able to pray with him and with the Christian community there. They have this custom, I'm told, of going out into the field uh, where the the angels appeared to the shepherds and singing glory to God in the highest, that beautiful oh, wow. hymn uh, announcing know. announcing the birth of Christ in the shepherd's field. So they have a custom of going out there. So I hope to be there in the shepherd's field on Christmas night, uh, which would be extraordinary. Mm. And then, of course, the day after Christmas is observed by the Catholic Church as the Feast of St. Stephen, who is the first martyr of the New Testament. Um, and St. Stephen's the site of St. Stephen's martyrdom is currently held by uh, my Dominican brothers, where the, the caretakers of the Basilica of St. Stephen. Uh, so I'll be able to be with my Dominican brothers there celebrating the Feast of St. Stephen in the Basilica of St. Stephen. And then a few days later, uh, we'll come on Sunday, the Catholic Church will observe the Feast of the Holy Family. And to observe the Feast of the Holy Family, I'll head up to Nazareth where of course Jesus was raised and where the Holy Family dwelt. So, so those are those are the major for me. Those are the major spiritual mm -hmm. moments. Are really the heart of the pilgrimage, and to to carry the prayers of everyone, uh, everyone who shares their intentions with me to these sacred places to carry them in prayer is a huge part of this trip for me. It's really, it's really the the it's really what it means. In addition to the uh, the the element of of activism and uh, truth telling that goes along with the kind of journalistic side of the project. Really, there's this, the, for me as a priest, a spiritual side of being able to take with me the prayers that are entrusted to me and pray for them at these holy sites on these holy days. I actually haven't looked at the calendar, so I don't know, know the answer to this question where, where things fall. Um, will you be there for the, the Feast of the Holy Innocents as well? Uh, this is such a great question. I haven't been focused on that one. Oh, no, don't worry. Don't worry. I don't know if it gets swallowed by, by Sunday or something. Sometimes that happens. Um, but, um, but, uh, but regardless, you'll, you'll, uh, there is something, the reason I bring up the Holy Innocence, obviously, even if it gets swallowed by Sunday, um, it's still a reality, um, that you're there and, um, and their innocence suffering today there yeah, exactly. Um, as well. Uh, yeah. So just to, just to clarify, so that, will be, that will be observed this year. Yeah. It's, it, it, will falls be. The, okay. it falls okay. the Saturday just before Holy Family. Okay. 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 Yeah. I, I think once you get over there, you're going to find that a, a huge, um, a spiritual, um uh gift and um and opportunity for sacrifice as well if, if i know you well and i think i do um not only not only for for 
the Jews and others who were suffering over there, um, the innocents who were still um, some some still kidnapped, right? Since since the attacks, um, but but also in solidarity with the um, those most vulnerable here, um, back at home, um, you know, obviously the vulnerable, unborn, the elderly. Um, and and others who who suffer so much because they're they're seen as uh, uh, expendable or or uh, as part of what Pope Francis calls our throwaway society, um, and uh, I think you're going to find that super powerful when you get over there. Um, Pope, Pope Benedict, in a Christmas Eve homily that I love, he talks about uh, observing uh, Bethlehem, looking at Bethlehem as uh, as the place where where, of course, a light has shown that has never been extinguished, he says. The light of Bethlehem mm -hmm. has never been extinguished. And from that light of Bethlehem, from this place, a stream of light, love, and truth spreads through the centuries. So I just love this idea that Bethlehem is a kind of font, and it has an important archaeological significance in that way because the Bethlehem water uh, actually was carried to Jerusalem through a Roman aqueduct. So there's a kind of ancient historical archaeological aspect to this. Uh, so this so Bethlehem water plays an important historical archaeological role in the region. Anyway, but if we think of Bethlehem as a kind of font of light and goodness and love, we can see a hope coming from Bethlehem. And that for me is so powerful. Um, you know, so, so again, we're asking why make this trip now at this time? Well, because the Catholic Church is about to open the great Jubilee year. That, mm. which Pope Francis has called uh, which is Pope Francis has called and spoken of as a jubilee of hope. Uh, so so for me, I will be beginning this jubilee year in the Holy Land in Bethlehem, the place that Pope Benedict calls uh, a source of hope, a stream of light, love, and truth that is uh, a flood of goodness that comes down, a path of radiant light coming from Bethlehem. that that for me is an extraordinary spiritual opportunity, um, but one that I one that I hope to share and one that I hope others will see and be able to benefit from through the pilgrimage. And now most people probably have no idea what a Jubilee year is. Um, what, what, what is it and why is it important? It's, a, it, it, it's such an important thing in the spiritual life and it's such a great opportunity for us to make the most of. So a Jubilee year comes from, uh, well, it has roots rather in the Old Testament in the practice of Israel to have a, a great jubilee every 50 years where slaves were freed, where debts were paid, where land was restored to its original owners, this, this sort of thing. It was a very, very ancient custom uh, promulgated uh, in the Old Testament uh, and, and followed for many years by the sons and daughters of Israel. Uh, the Catholic Church seized uh, upon this great and noble tradition and adopted a version of it as our own beginning in 1300 when Pope Boniface VIII promulgated the first jubilee as we now know it. And since that time, roughly uh, every 25 years in the Catholic Church, we've held a kind of jubilee year, which has been a privileged spiritual time. So, so various graces in, in the church, we use the technical word of indulgence, but it's very grace, various graces that become opened to the faithful. And it's a call really to redouble our spiritual exercises, to grow in the spiritual life, to be keenly attentive to the spiritual life in in these special days of jubilee this special time so 2025 then um is the is the next ordinary jubilee year and uh, as i said pope francis has promulgated this jubilee to be a, a jubilee year of hope and one of the aspects of the jubilee that i love is that it will be um a jubilee of uh for young people so several of the the major moments in the jubilee will be gatherings for young people that will happen at various times in Rome uh, to ignite the, the faith of young people in a special way to celebrate the faith of young people. Um, and I think there's kind of a natural fit when we look to hope, we think of youth. And that's why I like this idea that that I'll be beginning this year and be and and am encouraging others to join me spiritually in beginning this year in Bethlehem, because Bethlehem is, of course, the birthplace of Christ, the, the, the coming of youth. Uh, it's the site, as we were talking about, of this baby hospital where so many children um, experience and taste life on this side of eternity for the first time every year and which is which is which is just such an incredible place um it's a birthplace and birth uh in in a way has a real resonance with this concept of hope that's very powerful in the spiritual life and i think will will make itself manifest and will grow in our hearts in in a particular way during this jubilee year well, since you talk about young people and we're having this conversation online, I can't help but ask about your friend Carlos, 
Could you uh, <laughs> say a few words about him? Well, I, so it's funny you mentioned him. I have, uh, I have him right here with me always. I have little holy cards of Blessed Carlo Acutis, who will be canonized during this Jubilee year. Uh, so, of course, in the Catholic Church, a canonized saint uh, means that the Church has dogmatically declared that this person is worthy of veneration and imitation. There are many people who are holy in our lives. We all know uh, what we like to call lowercase s saints in our lives. Uh, I'm speaking to one right now in Catherine Jean Lopez, but uh, but, okay. but but there are capital S saints proclaimed by the church, uh, capital S saints. Um, and what I love about Carlo's life and example is that he used the web, the internet, in a special way. Uh, he he was one of the first builders of great websites. He loved to explain Catholic teaching, and he uh, used these websites he built uh, particularly to focus on. Um, clarifying Catholic teaching about the Eucharist, which is so beautiful. He built a marvelous display about Eucharistic miracles. And uh, through that website, many people have come to encounter the faith in a way that they otherwise wouldn't have. So Carlo will be part of the Jubilee celebrations, as well as Pier Giorgio Frassati, who's mm -hmm. connected to my own Dominican religious order through, uh, through a particular series of vows. So Pier Giorgio Frassati will also be canonized next year um and these two it young italian men um each each with a, with a very beautiful personal story represent something of the ever newness of holiness um the dynamism of holiness and i think they contribute in their own way to this jubilee year of hope by their their very contemporary example you see they both died very young and they both died recently especially from the perspective of catholic teaching so blessed carlo acutis died in 2006 Pier Giorgio Frassati early in the 20th century. I mean, from, from the Catholic perspective, this is yesterday. <laughs> and and you, you've, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you've met a blessed Carlo's mother, right? Yes. Oh, it was a Marvel. wonderful experience, you know. And so you, you think of just how recent this is. This, this is so recent that this young man's mother is going around the world telling the story of her incredibly holy son, uh, mm. which, which in my own, my own encounter, um, I got to celebrate a mass that uh, that she was attending, and I found myself there preaching about her son. You know what 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 could I have to say to the mother about the son? Uh, and and what it made me think of Catherine was it made me think of what it would have been like for the Virgin Mary to hear the preaching of the apostles about Jesus Christ after the resurrection. Wow. Um, you know, and she, surely the Virgin Mary would have had technical points to add from her from her great and, <laughs> and very didn't need to hear knowledge. anything about her son right <laughs> Jesus, exactly but but here but here we have here we have a here we have a mother who knows and loves her son and has dedicated her life to to spreading his legacy in a beautiful way um i, I just couldn't help but make that connection and that's the certainly a connection that springs from bethlehem um but but that flows that flows down through the ages through through all of these holy men and women that have imitated the holy family um, you you mentioned Pope Benedict's sermon um, about Bethlehem and hope, and uh, I can't help but think of Paul the Sixth's beautiful sermon that's in the Office of Readings about the Holy Family being the school of uh, the school of Nazareth, where we learn how to be holy and Christian and uh, and love one another. And goodness knows we need that um, um, as as families as as Christians living in the world in um in the the chaos that it is right now and before i ask you some super practical questions i just want to point out um you know one of the re one of the reasons i'm grateful you're going is just on a personal level my uh my late friend kato burn who was washington editor of national review for a long time and um head of the national review institute for a time too um used to say Every priest should be be able to get to Rome and the Holy Land. So I'm I'm glad I, I know you've been to Rome. I'm glad you're you're now getting to the Holy Land. She would she would be very pleased. Um, and um, but the other thing is um, we we have another late friend. Um, in common, um, Andrew Walther, who did a lot of work for persecuted Christians. And one of the things that I encountered the most when um, when I was uh, when I was uh, doing work with Andrew is how many um, Westerners, Christians in particular, had no idea there were any Christians in the Middle East. 
No idea. No idea. And when you think about like, we're talking about Bethlehem and Nazareth, and it's kind of crazy that they wouldn't have given it a thought, but certainly they have no idea that there are Christians in Iraq and, and Syria and whatnot. Um, but so to shine a light on the mere fact that they exist, you know, again, without political commentary, um, I think is, is very important and very important at this time of year when people will actually pay attention, honestly, you know, um, if you, if you made a trip to Bethlehem, um, around election day, nobody would have paid attention to you, you know, um, but, uh, but Christmas gives a built-in, uh, uh, reason for people to pay attention. Yeah, they're really at risk of being erased, Catherine. I think that's what, to your yep. point, that that, uh, that that we're not aware really of the Christian communities who live there. We're not really aware of what they're going to. So, 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 just some raw numbers here. In the last six months, over sixty families, sixty-four, sixty-five, if memory serves, so, but but more than sixty families in the last six months have left Bethlehem. And when you when you I begin can't looking at the population, to have 60 families leave. Exactly, exactly. The Christian population of Bethlehem is twenty five hundred, maybe at the very most three thousand people. You know, we're talking we're talking like ten percent. That could be ten percent of right. the Christian population of the place that that has had to flee. Um, and, and this this is really this is really an erasure of their history and and threatens their ability to continue to care for these holy sites. And to to hand on the legacy of faith, which has been handed on through the centuries, and w when you begin to look at the history of Bethlehem, this is something that that the Arab Christians who live there, who have lived there basically from the beginning, have suffered again and again through these two millennia since the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, the the uh, it's it's been a, a, a very very uh, violent, precarious, tenuous existence that they've had there. Um, even recently, with uh, with the, with the British occupation of the Holy Land, um, within you know that's a, that's a hundred years ago. But even even recently, they've experienced uh, tumults. Now, one thing that's beautiful about going this year in twenty twenty four is that it's sixty years since Paul the Sixth first made his pilgrimage. Uh, Paul the Sixth being the the first pope in the modern era to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And he celebrated the, the Feast of the Epiphany. I'll be home by then, but he celebrated the Feast of the Epiphany in the Holy Grotto in Bethlehem. That was January 6, 1964. Um, so I'm within that, that anniversary year of Paul VI's visit to Bethlehem. And on that occasion, uh, Paul, VI, uh, Paul VI called for a very beautiful, uh, very beautiful um, attention. You know, he called the church in a very beautiful way to attend to the Holy Land, to pay attention to uh, the mysteries and the experience of the, of the Catholic Christians who live there. Um, we, we frequently see pop up in the prayer of the church, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. As a Catholic priest going there at this time, um, do you have a particular prayer for, for those suffering, the Israelis who are suffering, um, the the Arab Muslims who are suffering, who are, because not all Arab Muslims are members of Hamas, and not all Arabs are or or even are are Muslims, and and um, as you mentioned, Arab Christians, right? Um, what what is your prayer for maybe in particular um, the Jews who we know um, there is a special hatred for in the world, um, but um, but also for, obviously for everyone there. Paul VI, when he was there in Bethlehem, described Bethlehem as a place of purity and calm, where where Christ was born. You know, of course, now two two millennia ago, um, and the most important title of Christ in that place is that it, that he is the Prince of Peace, mm. um, and that everyone who celebrates truth, everyone that celebrates justice, everyone that celebrates authentic human freedom, everyone that celebrates. The, the, the common fraternity of all men can celebrate this prince, can celebrate this prince of peace. And I think that that, that in, in the grandest way is what Christians are exalting in um, at Christmas, that the coming of our Savior is an invitation for everyone who would know and love, again, the truth, um, who would know and love justice, who would know and, and love the, the, the fraternity that binds all men, and can rejoice in this Prince of Peace and can turn to him in their prayer. Uh, and so, so I'm, I'm carrying that in my heart, that, 
that this was the acclamation, you know, glory to God in the highest, the angels sang in the field. And what did they wish for everyone? They said, peace yeah. to, to all, all men of goodwill. Uh, this, this was the great proclamation. And so it's certainly my, my hope that, uh, that everyone I encounter would, would, would discover that peace for his or herself this Christmas. Um, to make a trip like this, you know, I'm not going with a big group. I'm going m m myself as a, as a Catholic priest and as a journalist accompanied by uh, just a few key people. We'll be just a small group. Um, but really, it's a it's a declaration of our solidarity with those who are suffering. You know, so many times we, we can't fix the problem. I know I'm not going to the Holy Land to, to fix the problem. I'm not the one who brings peace. Only Jesus Christ brings peace. That's what I believe as a Christian. But I do know, I do know that when you are with someone in their suffering, that brings an alleviation that 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 is its own healing balm. And so part of part of what I want to communicate by this pilgrimage is that we're bringing our prayers, we're bringing support, our support. Uh, this pilgrimage is made possible in partnership with Select to Give, which is an incredible charity that has raised over a quarter of a million dollars to support Christians. Um, in the Holy Land this year, Select to Give is operated totally by volunteers. So we're bringing real support um, to people who need it most. But we're also bringing we're also bringing our bringing ourselves, you know, just laying down our lives. And th that's that's not just me, but that's everyone who's traveling spiritually with me, uh, praying for the pilgrimage, thinking about it, following it, um, is a sign of that extraordinary solidarity that these people have not been forgotten. And that's all part of the movement of of peace. And that's all part of the movement of peace building. And so I I argue that it has those three keys. Um, that we would that we would first and foremost pray for peace and never give up on that prayer for peace. That we would support financially, however we able, however we're able to, those who are suffering, and that we would recognize that drawing our hearts and minds to be attentive to this crisis, especially to those who are suffering because of because of the war, um, is contributing something. And that solidarity, that gift of presence, makes a difference in the lives of those who feel forgotten. And um, I don't mean to skip uh, liturgical seasons, but I have to say the two times I've been in the Holy Land, um, I am so struck by Jerusalem. And, you know, you know, you hear about the violence of the region all the time in the news. But uh, I, I remember the last time I was there, um, it was right it were maybe maybe six months before the war started. Um, and, uh, you know, I was tired after a long flight and, uh, it's four o'clock in the morning or whatever it was. And I hear the Muslim call to prayer and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to sleep in. I'll go early to the church of the Holy Sepulcher tomorrow. And I hear the Muslim call to prayer and I'm like, hello, I'm in Jerusalem for Pete's sake get out of bed, get dressed, <laughs> go pray. And then when, when you go into the old city of, of Jerusalem at 4.30 in the morning, it's Muslims, Jews, and Christians pr who are going to pray. And it is the most peaceful place in the world as far as I, I'm concerned um, because people know what they're about um or want want to be who they say they are you know right and and that's why they're there and it really is so beautiful um and um and bethlehem of course is is um a, another aspect of it but i mean christ you talk about the prince of peace but christ also died for the peace that only he alone can bring right you know that the world can't give us and um so the whole the whole story of salvation history um, is uh, is is just such a such something we need to be constantly re reminded of and remind each other of by the way we live our lives. Um, so, super practically speaking, so you're not going on this pilgrimage for yourself, although you certainly are. You know that's one aspect of it. Um, but you are bringing, you are blessed to have this platform. So you are bringing anyone who wants to go with you, with you, um, by, uh, by you're, you're going to have these emails that are going out. Could you, could you explain how that's going to work and how people can sign up and they can sign up before that, right. And, and get, get, uh, daily emails even before that. Absolutely. So the, so the, the, 
key means that people will be invited to join the pilgrimage are to follow every day uh, my daily newsletter. So I write for Our Sunday Visitor. You can sign up for that newsletter by visiting OurSundayVisitor.com slash Catherine Lopez. Got a nice <laughs> little custom URL Hi. for you there. Yeah, OurSundayVisitor.com slash Catherine Lopez. Um, and uh, your listeners and your friends, your readers will be able to sign up uh, for my newsletter there. Each day I'll have a little reflection about Bethlehem throughout the Advent season. And then when I'm there on the ground, um, just a few days before Christmas, content will be presented from the Holy Land. So I'll be able to share things that I'm experiencing as I'm sharing, as I'm experiencing them rather, from the Holy Land. So that would be the, the best way to follow along. Or on social media, you can follow Our Sunday Visitor um, at OSV on X or at Our Sunday Visitor on Instagram and see regular posts from me uh, coming live. Those will be additional things that are not there in the newsletter. So again, the newsletter will, will be largely thematic and Advent reflections, but focused on Bethlehem and the meaning of Bethlehem and what the people of Bethlehem are, are experiencing leading up to Christmas. And then just before Christmas, that's when the, the height of the pilgrimage will really begin. And you'll be able to see the things that I'm seeing and read the stories uh, that I'm capturing. And you'll, it won't just be text, it'll be video as well, right? Exactly, yes, yeah. So the daily reflections, that's a thats a fun part of this. The daily reflections are, are video. You can tune in, you can watch them, you can listen to them, uh, you can read them. Um, and again, those are, uh, those are largely, those are, those are really largely spiritual through the season of Advent. And then once we, once we get to Christmas, they'll include more stories from, uh, from the places and people that I'm meeting. And I just, um, just as a little plug for your newsletter, just on a regular basis, you do a good job of being a news filter, a spiritual filter. You know, you don't have to be a pious Catholic to sign up for this newsletter. I think there are things that'll be of cultural interest um, as well. Um, I have a colleague who um, we were we were discussing the other day how he fluctuates between being agnostic and an atheist, but he's got this little boy who's in a charter school that's based in a parish in New York, and you know what the parish is. Um, and uh, and anyway, his 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 little son is asking all these questions, and my atheist slash agnostic friend is an honest guy and so he's telling telling the stories as he knows them to be um even if he doesn't know that he believes them and um you know you don't have to know if you believe this stuff um to to listen in <laughs> and um and go along um because obviously there's a cultural aspect to it and if you have any curiosity about um christianity and and its roots um, and its relevance today, I think, um, I think following along with Father Patrick is, is a, a great way to go, um, to spend, to spend some of your December. Um, I, I think you won't, you won't regret it. Um, and, uh, so Father Patrick, any, any final words, um, uh, about your pilgrimage and, and what you're hoping other people get out of it? Well, I don't know if I'll get the Holy Land tattoo. I've not decided on that yet. <laughs> but, but the pilgrim, the pilgrim tattoo is an ancient tradition. But uh, Father, Father Mike Schmitz, who, my, who many of your your listeners and readers probably have heard of, and the Catholic priest who did the Bible in a Year podcast, Father Schmitz got the tattoo in the Holy Land. It caused quite a stir. But uh, but I think that uh, I, I think that what I'm looking forward to most again is um, is really encountering uh, the people of Bethlehem on the days that are so sacred to them and joining them for the traditions that make uh, that make the observance of these feasts so great. Um, it, it really is a once in a lifetime trip. And to have the opportunity to travel to the Holy Land to observe these feasts on the days in the places where, where they are where they are, are are held in pride of place by the church is, is such a privilege. Um, and I, I will be praying for uh, I will be praying for many intentions and carrying them in my heart. Um, so I hope that I hope that your listeners, your readers, um, will share those with us. You know, by 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 signing up for this newsletter, there will be an opportunity to send your intentions there to these places at these times, um, because we know that that our prayers really do make a difference. That there are some things that God has ordained in His providence that can come about only because we pray for them, and it gives a kind of urgency to to this work. Um, and uh, I know, again, I know, I don't know how. But I do know 
that because I'm going, uh, I will be changed because of the trip. And I know, uh, I know that the people I meet will be changed too. Well, um, I've known you since you were a student brother and um, you've gone this long without a tattoo. So uh, my, my son, please uh, do not go for a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> if you were still a student brother, I'd excuse it. But <laughs> although we did find a Jerusalem cross in my office the other day, <laughs> I did not get a tattoo, but I have a Jerusalem cross in my office. I knew you were a radical. <laughs> well, thank you, Father Patrick. And I really do encourage people to sign up for this newsletter. I think it will be, um, uh, it will, it will, it will just add to your, your advent and your Christmas. And, um, and, um, I, I, I can't wait to see what, uh, what you see, Father Patrick. Thanks. Thanks so much. And, and, um, again, how do people sign up for the newsletter and, and how do they read OSV on a, a regular basis? Fabulous. So you can follow all of our online content at OurSundayVisitor.com. To sign up for the newsletter, all of you that are Catherine Lopez fans, visit OurSundayVisitor.com slash Catherine Lopez. And I would just make one last little plug. Consider getting our beautiful monthly magazine. Again, the, de the December issue has a marvelous feature of the Bethlehem Baby Hospital telling the beautiful story of, of this special Christian ministry in the birthplace of Christ. So you can get more information about our magazine at OurSundayVisitor.com slash subscribe. Well, thank you, Father Patrick. God bless you. God bless your travels. And thank you, everyone who uh, who, who is tuning into this. Um, please share this with other people who might be curious, who might um, about Christianity in the Holy Land, about Christianity, period, um, who might be looking for some um, added edification, spiritual edification during during the Advent and Christmas season. Um, this is uh, this is an easy way. It'll be in your inbox um, and won't take a, a ton of your time, um, but it will add a richness to the season. So uh, th thank you all on behalf of the National Review Institute, and thank you again, Father Patrick. And uh, Father Patrick, what, what are you on X? Please, friends, if you want uh, a lively Catholic priest to follow, check me out. I'm at Patrick Mary OP. And I'll tweet a tattoo of my, or tweet a picture of my tattoo to you, Catherine. <laughs> I'm sure you will. All right. <laughs> Godspeed. Bye-bye. <laughs>